morning. Good morning and welcome this morning. Happy New Year. Yeah, we, uh, Brian is away in Ohio visiting his parents this weekend, so I am here with you. Um, and, and welcome back to uh, 2019. It's good to get back into the routine of team. One quick announcement as we start, actually two quick announcements. One, again, if you are able this morning when we're done, um, to help out our facilities team by putting some of the tables away. We appreciate um, anyone that's able to stick around and help out with that. We don't need to stack the chairs or anything like that. We just need to get the tables put away. So if you're able, we'd love your help. And then two, next week, um, we want to honor the memory of John Harper by wearing cargo shorts. Next, uh, if you know John, you know that he wore shorts pretty much 365. Um, there was like a negative 30 window where he would maybe put on pants if that was gonna be if he was working outside kind of thing. And John was such an integral part of, of the team experience and what happened here. If you are able, I know some of your work responsibilities won't, won't enable that, but um, next week is his birthday. And we want to just remember him and celebrate his impact with us. Um, and so everybody that is able, uh, we want to invite you to wear um, shorts next week to, to team with us. Well, I'm going to start off 2019 with a bad joke. So here we go. Yes, same way we started off 2018, right? There is a, a nun who comes up to a priest and uh, mentions to him that there is, she says to him, there's a hole in the roof of your church, Father. And the priest responds and says, well, well, thank you for telling me that, but you've been here for years now. Um, this isn't just my church. This is, this is our church. You need to think of this as, as your church as well. And so she hears him and understands that and and the next day she sees him again and she goes up and says, Father, there's, there is a broken window in your, and stops herself and says, in, in our church. And he thanks her again and, and appreciates the fact that she's taking ownership and calls a repairman. Well, the following day, the, the priest is preparing for a visit from the local bishop. And in order to prepare, he's out weeding the gardens in front of the church. And while he's doing so, he, he cuts his hand. He calls over the nun and said, there is a, a bottle of rubbing alcohol in my quarter somewhere. Would you mind running and fetching it for me? And the nun nods and goes and look for it. Just as the bishop arrives and the priest is greeting him, the nun returns from the church and loudly proclaims, Father, don't worry about the weed. The alcohol was under our bed. <laughs> I will, uh, we'll mark that one down as mildly inappropriate and... Today we are uh, actually going to be looking at week 11 in your books. This is the week that we skipped from Santa Gate a couple weeks ago, um, entitled, Can You Handle the Truth? Where we're going to be looking together this morning at the relationship between David and the prophet Nathan. Now automatically when you hear that title, Can You Handle the Truth? We, our minds automatically go to the classic Jack Nicholas scene from A Few Good Men. Um, but because we've used that one before and because it requires a decent amount of editing on our behalf, um, we're, we're actually going to pull another clip from a movie we looked at um, just before Christmas, Remember the Titans. Now, if you recall, that, that movie tells the story, captures the story of a football team following the process of integration. And at the outset of the season, there's, there's all this racial tension on the team as the students learn to to trust and to respect each other, to work together as a team. In the scene that we're going to look at this morning, we see two of, of the key players on that team, uh, a, a student by the name of Gary, who is the white kid on the team, he's the captain of the team, and, and he comes in with a certain degree of expectation, and then another student by the name of Julius, who is an African-American student and, and probably the most talented kid on the team. 
And in this scene, you're going to see how they, they confront each other with, with an important truth. Check this out. All right, man, listen. I'm Gary. You're Julius. Let's get some particulars and just get this over with, all right? Particulars. Yeah. No matter what I tell you, you ain't gonna never know nothing about hey, me. Hey, listen, I ain't running any more of these three days, okay? Well, what I got to say, you really don't want to hear, because honesty ain't too high up on your people priority list, right? Honesty? You want honesty? All right, honestly, I think you're nothing. Nothing but a pure waste of God-given talent. You don't listen to nobody, man. Not even Doc or Boone. Shiver push on the line every time, man. You blow right past them. Push them. Pull them, do something. You can't run over everybody in this league. And every time you do, you leave one of your teammates hanging out to dry. Me in particular. Why should I give a hoot about you? Huh? Or anybody else out there? You want to talk about a waste? You the captain, right? Right. Captain's supposed to be the leader, right? Right. You got a job? I have a you job. You been doing your job? I've been doing my job. Then why don't you tell your white buddies to block for Rev better? Because they have not blocked for him. Work for Plug Nickel, and you know it. Nobody plays, yourself included. I'm supposed to wear myself out for the team? What team? No, no, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna look out for myself and I'm gonna get mine. See, man, that's the worst attitude I ever heard. Attitude reflect leadership, Captain. It's a powerful scene. Um, it's a scene in which each of those players where Julius and Gary are both asking the other to be confronted with the truth. The truth as, as they see it, and Julius has that line there at the end where he presses on just that exact point where he says, attitude reflects leadership, Captain. The last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the theme of, of the power of spiritual friendship together. And we've looked specifically at some key relationships in the life of, of King David. Just before Christmas, we looked at David with his, his mighty men, his, his warriors, as they were called. Prior to that, we were looking at the relationship that David had with Jonathan, the son of, of King Saul, and then with King Saul himself. As, as Saul deteriorated into a jealous and bitter man. He was actually hunting for David to kill him when David had the opportunity to defend himself and, and kill Saul. But he refuses to do so out of love and respect for God. He won't take matters into his own hand and he chooses to trust God. So today we're going to pick up the story a number of years later. David has now become the king of Israel. He's been incredibly successful in, in, in almost every imaginable way. He's had military victories. Economically, he has a large family, and there's a sense of security and confidence in the kingdom. But power and position eventually get to him as well. Towards the end of, of King David's reign, after so much success, David, like so many men before and after him, fell into temptation. As the story goes, one evening David was alone on the rooftop of his palace in a season where it says that the kings are out to war, um, but David is not. He's at home and he's alone and he sees a beautiful woman on a rooftop named Bathsheba bathing. David ultimately makes the choice to have her brought to his palace and has an affair with her. Not only that, Bathsheba is the wife of one of his own warriors, a man who is currently away fighting his battle to protect and to defend his kingdom, a man by the name of Uriah. As a result of this affair, Bathsheba becomes pregnant. David realizes the situation and in an attempt to cover it up, he, he has Uriah brought home from the battlefield, intending for him to sleep with his wife and then to believe that the baby is his own. But it doesn't work, even despite the fact that David has Uriah brought into the palace and, 
and shares a meal with the king and, and, and makes sure that he is overserved. Uriah refuses himself any luxury, even being with his wife while his fellow soldiers remain on the battlefield. And so David is left with no other options. He sends Uriah back into the battle carrying orders that ultimately will send him to his death. David sends orders to his commanding officers to have Uriah move to the front of the battle where he knows that he'll be killed. And that's exactly what happens. So David, this, this great king who in so many ways has been this incredible example of faithfulness and trust and, and courage and honor, a man who is later described as a man after God's own heart, this David commits adultery and then sends Bathsheba's husband, one of his own trusted warriors, to his death, all to cover up his sin. This is the context of the interaction that we're going to look at today between David and the prophet Nathan. A, a man who, who served as sort of a... a uh, a priest or a pastor to the king in, and to Israel. So this is from 2 Samuel chapter 12. This is where we pick things up this morning. 2 Samuel chapter 12. It says, The Lord sent Nathan to David. And when he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had brought, bought. And he raised it, and he grew up, and it grew up with, his ch with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arm. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house to you, your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Amorites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your household, I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to the one who is close to you, and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did this in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. Now, this, is a, this, is a, this is a tough passage. Um, and, and I, I want to add the caveat here that, that David is... Um, hearing from Nathan the, the consequences of his sin, yet he is forgiven. Nathan clearly speaks that into David in, in verse 13 or 14. He says, the, lo the Lord has taken away your sin, but you're still dealing with some rather dire consequences as the result of your sin. The, the, the only caveat I want to add here is sometimes that we can, as men, look at situations in our lives and circumstances in our lives and, and make the connection from passages like this that things going on with our family or things going on with our kids or things going on in our lives are somehow the result of our own sin. And certainly we do experience consequences as a result of sin, even in the midst of forgiveness. But that does not mean that everything happening in our lives is somehow the result of something we 
have done. So it's important for us to understand that. But David is put into a high power of position and authority. And because he abuses that power and authority, there are severe consequences. This encounter between David and the prophet Nathan is, this is an incredible example of the power of spiritual friendship. And yet this passage is also incredibly difficult. This morning I want us to just look at three qualities of, of spiritual friendship that I think are present in this passage. Beginning with the, the reality that a friend expects the best. A friend expects the best. I, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you have seen someone completely act out of character. Where, where, you, where there is sort of a misalignment between who you know them to be and what you know that they believe and how they are currently living their lives. Or perhaps from the other perspective, has that ever been you? I can remember I, I grew up in, in a small town in rural Ohio. Um, I went to public school and, and I was born and raised in the church. And from a very early age, I sort of got the reputation amongst my friends and at the school as sort of being the Christian kid, right? Like the guys on the basketball team would call me choir boy and all these sorts of things because I didn't, I didn't talk like they did. I didn't, I didn't do some of the stuff that they were doing. I was intentionally trying to live my life differently. And yet there was, there was a, a cost around that. And like every middle school kid, I desperately wanted to fit in. I desperately wanted a, a sense of belonging. And so one, one time in eighth grade, I decided I would. And my, my, Public, high, uh, public middle school, at the end of our eighth grade year, we would take an annual trip to Washington, D.C. It was like kind of a rite of passage thing. And I decided on that trip that I was going to, to be like everyone else. I was going to talk like they did. I was finally going to fit in. And so I did. Um, and, and I acted very differently. And I, I, I talked to my teachers and the, the leaders and the chaperones um, very differently. And I, I talked about other people very differently. And I remember near the end of the trip, one of the other students um, looking at me and kind of like with shock on his face and just asking me the question, who are you? Like, who are you? See, there was a clear con disconnect for this student between who I was, what he knew about me, who I had been for the entire span of our friendship and how I was acting on that trip. And I don't think that that student intentionally had in mind uh, playing the role of Nathan in my life. I think he was just shocked. But to him, the reality was my life was out of alignment. And he was calling it out as, as best as he knew how by asking that simple question, who, who are you? Like, I, don't, I don't recognize you. See, up to this point in, in David's life, he's been defined by his commitment and his obedience to God. Even in the midst of extreme opposition, you think about, about being a, a shepherd boy that's thrown into a situation where you are battling against the Philistines' number one warrior, this giant of a man, Goliath. But David was faithful. You, you found yourself hiding in caves in the wilderness in order to avoid the threats of, of the king of Israel, Saul. But David was faithful. But success now appears to have ushered in comfort. And, and comfort, as it so often does, gives way to compromise. And now David is acting, he's living as if he is accountable to no one. He, he's living as if, as if his authority as king is his ultimate authority. And the result is this disconnect, this misaligned life between who he has always been, the faith that he holds to, and how he's acting. And the results now are devastating. It, it's worth mentioning here that this storyline plays itself out in, in our culture, our workplaces, our families, our, our social circles on nearly a daily basis. We, we can't watch the evening news or read the headlines without coming across some variation of this same plot. Maybe not to this degree, but we recognize it. In fact, to, to various degrees, we can even see this, identify this, 
this sort of experience point to these moments in our own lives where we have lived out of misalignment. And I know that that's been true for me, and it's not just as a middle school student. So often we, we have these really tragic stories, particularly in the context of the church, where, where the misaligned life is, goes unchecked and unchanged, and the consequences, the, the ramifications of that become so devastating. And we're left sort of asking ourselves the question, how could this happen? How could this be allowed to take place? How did this go this far? Nathan's awareness of, of David's sin comes after the fact. But when he does become aware, he doesn't settle. He, he doesn't make excuses for David. He doesn't talk about the stress of his job. He doesn't talk about the pressures of being the king and somehow justify his action. No, Nathan expects more. He expects there to be alignment between the faith that he holds in Yahweh God and the action of his life. And so now, as a result of, of Nathan's expectation for David, because he expected the best from him, his expectation it causes him to take action. We see then that a friend is willing to confront. A friend is willing to confront. It, it can be one thing for you and I to expect the best from each other. But expectation that doesn't result in action is, is essentially useless. Let me ask you this morning, what is your sort of confrontation comfortability level? On a scale of one to 10, if, if one is avoided at all cost and 10 is sign me up, where are you at on that scale? Like I, I'm somewhere around a two, right? Like I, I consider myself to be something of a confrontation coward. Um, waiting way too long sometimes to address misalignment issues in the, in the lives of people that, that I care about. I can remember one such example where um, I was going to have lunch with a friend to have a difficult conversation, to address some things. And, and literally driving to that lunch, I was sweating profusely, like heart palpitations, like numbness in my left, like I had all the signs of like a heart attack or something, like going into that because I wanted to avoid it at all costs. And some of you can relate to that exact thing. But there's a couple things that I want, I want to point out here and I want to mention here as it relates to, to confrontation. And here's the reality. Confrontation is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for those who are delivering it. It's uncomfortable for the person receiving it. And, and just as a side note here, there is a difference between being critical and being confrontational. When I think of being critical, I think we're, we're talking about performance issues, right? Or am I doing my job well enough? Am I performing up to expectations? When we're talking about confrontation, we're talking about character issues. We're looking at what's inside. This is an important distinction because sometimes when we go into a situation, we need to ask ourselves, is this a performance issue or is this a character issue? And there, on the other side of that, there are times when performance is great, and because performance is great, we allow character issues to go unchecked. And we shouldn't do that. Imagine for a moment what Nathan must have been thinking and feeling when he is given the responsibility of confronting the king. Imagine the fear that, that he must have felt, the questions running through his mind. David has already proven that he's willing to dispense of, of one of the critical people in his life, one of his own warriors, in order to cover up his sin. Like what, what would prevent him from doing that again? Nathan is being sent to confront, to have a difficult conversation with the most powerful man in the entire kingdom. I don't think uncomfortable begins to describe what Nathan is feeling, what he's being asked to do. Fear is ultimately what, what keeps us from being willing to confront others. And fear, by the way, is also what prevents us from allowing or even inviting others into our own lives. 
to speak truth, to give them permission, even the responsibility of confronting us when our life is, is out of alignment with our faith. Fear ultimately keeps us from, from taking action. It's probably no surprise to you that over the last 18 months, there's been multiple stories in the Chicagoland areas of, of pastors abusing power in order to take advantage of their situation. And I'm not speaking into those situations. I don't know the details of those situations. That's not my point. But but I remember reading these articles and, and reading these stories and seeing sort of the devastation that was taking place in the lives of the church. And, and I felt compelled in that moment to, to speak into some of the lives of men around me and invite them, to give them the freedom to be able to call me out when they see things that were out of alignment. And I remember I, 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 I wrote the text message. I had it on my phone. It was sent, I, I sent it to four people and I remember just staring at my phone, feeling like this, this battle going on between me, between hitting sin and saying, listen, men, like when you see things that are out of alignment with the gospel in me, you have the responsibility to tell me. And there was so much that, that I felt this compulsion that I needed to send this. And yet everything inside of me said, I don't want to. Because I know that sending that message means that someday there's probably going to be a situation where one of these men come to me and say, Sterling, we need to talk. We, we need to sit down because there's some things that I'm seeing that I don't, I don't know if you're seeing them and you need to be aware of them. And I was already sort of in my mind dreading that future day when somebody was going to have that conversation with me. But then I looked again at the situation around us and I decided that the, the pain of that conversation would be worth avoiding the pain of the devastation that, that happens sometimes when those conversations fail to take place. See, what enables us to overcome the fear? What enables us to overcome the fear that comes around confrontation? It's ultimately when we understand that confrontation is an act of love. Confrontation is an act of love. Notice how this passage begins. The Lord sent Nathan to David. God loves David too much to leave him in his sin. God knows and understands that that unconfessed sin is erosive to David, that it, it, will, it will eat at his very relationship with God himself. He loves him too much to leave him there. And so he sends Nathan, who, who loves God too much to be disobedient, he loves David too much to allow his fear to overcome his responsibility to his king, despite the perceived risk. That earlier example of, of having to have a difficult uh, conversation where I, I felt like uh, sick going into that lunch. And, and I remember I was talking to a, a mentor or somebody in my life and just asking him, you know, what is it I should do? How do I handle this? And he, I remember them saying to me, you need to love him enough to have the conversation. In fact, that, that's, that line, you need to love him enough to have the conversation is ultimately what compelled me to do it. It's ultimately what gave me enough courage to be able to sit down and say, hey, let's, let's talk about this. See, confrontation, when, when done with the goal of restoration, is an act of love. And listen to me on this. We need to be a community that loves each other well enough to confront each other. We, we need to be a group, a community of men that loves each other well enough to, to have difficult conversations with each other. Thirdly, in this point, then confrontation must be handled carefully. Sorry, that's not the third point, but third part of point two. I just mentioned that the goal of confrontation is restoration. The objective must be front and center at all times. It must be front and center in our motivation and it must be front and center in our conversation. It must be clear why we are addressing these issues. If we fail in this regard, then our objective, our goal is rarely accomplished. See, when Nathan here confronts David, he, he does so by telling a story. 
He tells a story of, of injustice, a story that it would allow him to see, to, to understand from his perspective as king his own injustice. He presents it in a way that will allow David to hear and to understand the way his life is out of alignment with his faith. See, what's powerful about what Nathan does here is he is both gentle and he is very direct in his, conver- in his confrontation of King David because his objective is clear. He desires to see his sin confessed and David restored. So a friend expects the best. A friend is willing to confront. And then thirdly, a friend speaks the truth. A friend speaks the truth. Our our focus, our theme this year has been as iron sharpens iron, the power of spiritual friendship. Taken from that verse in Proverbs 27, verse 17, that says as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I think that the topic that Brian chose for this morning is, is one of those essential elements of this sharpening that Proverbs talk about. The essential elements of the sharpening that you and I are intended to play for each other. This this is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. For those of you who who know me, I am um, something of a hobbyist woodworker. It's it's kind of my what I do in my free time. And just over the last few months, I've sort of gotten into working with hand tools more with chisels and hand planes, and I want to learn how to do hand-cut dovetails and all this stuff. And, and one of the keys to working with hand tools, really to working with any, any woodworking tool, but hand tools specifically is how sharp your tool is. And so just in the last few months, I, I started to get the equipment that I needed to be able to sharpen my tools. This is like a, a diamond stone. So on this metal stone, there's just tiny, tiny fragments of diamonds. And if I hold this just right, and I hold my chisel, this is, that's real bad. Um, If I hold this chisel at just the right angle, and I I rub it along this stone, those tiny fragments of diamonds are going to remove steel from this blade. Essentially, they're going to remove the portions of this blade that are out of alignment, that are ultimately causing it to be dull. And they're going to, if I do this well, if I do this correctly, it will bring this blade into a razor sharpness. In fact, you can test a good chisel to see if it's sharp by taking a piece of paper and just running it into it. And if it's sharp, it will slice through that paper unrestricted, just just like a, a, a razor that you would shave with or something else. Because it's removed the material, the things that that don't belong, that are keeping it out of, of, of alignment. See, this is the role that we are to play for each other of knowing, of, of understanding and confronting each other with the truth in order to bring our lives into razor sharpness. And oftentimes that happens, it, it's accomplished by coming into the abrasive encounter with the truth. That abrasive encounter with the truth that removes the material that's out of alignment. See, you and I would all agree, and we've talked about this this year, that, that to be a spiritual friend for someone means that we, we love and accept them where they are. In fact, that, that logic, that understanding sometimes is what we use to sort of convince ourselves that we don't need to have these conversations. We're just going to love each other and, and, and not address these issues. We would all agree that a friend is loyal, that we would stick by each other through good and bad. But hear me on this true spiritual friendship is also about the truth. It's about speaking truth into each other's lives. David, after hearing Nathan tell that story, is outraged. In fact, he he demands justice. And then there's this poignant moment of truth in verse 7 where Nathan looks at David and says, you are that man. This is you, David. This is what you've done. David's life encounters the abrasive nature of truth because Nathan takes him there. Let's not kid ourselves. What we're talking about this morning is incredibly difficult. Speaking truth in friendship is difficult. 
Speaking truth and friendship can even be dangerous. Nathan is probably feeling like his, his life is at risk. You and I in these situations are often going into it feeling like a relationship is at risk. Like if I don't do this well, if my friend can't hear this, then, then I risk losing this friendship. But speaking the truth is necessary. It's vital, in fact. If we're truly going to live out this verse in Proverbs that it says is iron sharpens iron. So one man sharpens another. I want to just conclude this by reading for you from Psalm 51. This is David's psalm after he's been confronted by Nathan. These are just a few verses here, and I don't have these on the screen. I'm just going to, I just want you to hear them. This is verse 10. He says, Created me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. See, Nathan brings him to that place of restoration. And God intends in our spiritual friendships that you and I will do that for each other. Uh, I'm going to uh, show you, actually, I don't think we have them up here. The questions for today are in your book. Um, Have you ever had a friend that cared enough to tell you the truth even when you didn't want to hear it? explain and then secondly do you have a friendship now that is strong enough to handle the truth and then i would just add one one optional third question who should you actively invite into your life as someone who would be willing to speak uncomfortable truth when you need to hear it who is somebody that you can invite they have to have enough proximity they have to be around you enough but who is somebody that you can actively say to them Hey, I need, to, I need you to tell me when you see things that are out of alignment. You can grab some more coffee, um, get a donut, and then we'll continue the conversation, and I'll come up and, and close us at prayer in, uh, in a few minutes.